Tracheal bruising? I don't know if I pronounced that right. Our likely diagnosis is hickey. I'm not having sex. You're lying or I'm wrong. Or there's some middle ground. You mean like oral? Like oral. Like oral. Why do they always have to make the blondes one fry shot of a happy meal? You see, the middle ground the house is talking about is that she is having sex but doesn't know about it. Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 1, Episode 17, Role Model. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 house videos, and this would be Episode 43. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. I still only have $58 in my savings account. <laughs> and in closing... Union members are hurting. They don't care about moral <laughs> Now that is how you open a medical drama. Seems like he's a presidential candidate who, mid-speech to donors and union bosses, started feeling dizzy, had a vomit, and then collapsed. Seemed like his speech fluency was affected as well. Now there are so many things that could have caused this one. One suspicion is raised intracranial pressure, which can explain the dizziness, vomiting, and collapse, especially if he has a brain tumor. Other causes could be metabolic, like Addison's disease, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, infectious, politicians travel a lot, he could have malaria or yellow fever, or maybe he's been trying a bit too hard to win over the voters and won himself a HIV diagnosis. Could be degenerative like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's plus syndrome like multiple systems atrophy. Unlikely though, as that wouldn't be reversible. Could be neoplastic, like a brain tumor or lymphoma. Could be inflammatory, like sarcoidosis. He's an African-American, so could be a good diagnosis. It's more common in African-Americans. Maybe he's got a non-case eating granuloma somewhere as well. Could also be <coughs> lupus. <coughs> Could be traumatic as well, maybe he had an over-enthusiastic head massage before his speech, causing a brain bleed. Anything is possible, let's get more clues. The senator is suffering from nausea, headache, and mental confusion. Yeah. Because you need to prove to me that you're a team player now. Eastbrook Pharmaceuticals has developed a new ACE inhibitor. You can either give one 10-minute talk and one three-minute diagnosis, or you can fire one of your pets. What? House can save one of his team members now, and all for the small price of helping Vogler's pharmaceutical company make billions from drug sales. Maybe billionaire Vogler isn't quite the philanthropist we would have hoped since he wants House to give a presentation on Viapril at a cardiology conference about a drug created for the sole purpose of his company being able to jack up the price for a drug it already sells. In real life, that presentation would have to be stuffed with so many conflict of interest statements that the talk would be over before House got to the point. Now you may say, where's the harm in doing that speech? Vogler gave him all the data. Excellent question. Glad you asked. Lex Chen and colleagues in 2003 published an article in the British Medical Journal proving that drug trials sponsored by pharmaceutical companies were four times more likely to show an outcome favoring the sponsor compared to other sponsors. The reasons found were likely due to publication bias. If studies showed a drug wasn't as effective as expected, then it was much less likely to be published. Even beyond that, in 2015, a guy called Yanidis statistically demonstrated why most published research findings are false. Most studies lack the robust methodology and adequate statistical rigor to actually produce valuable findings. That is why it's so important to get your information from a reliable source that knows how to interpret research findings. So well done for finding this video as I happen to have a master's degree in medical research, which I can finally use. Anyways, hit me with the clues, Sherlock. I've been under the weather for weeks, you know, lots of traveling. An MRI and a lumbar puncture. The senator's LP showed no sign of infection, and the MRI looks fairly clean. 
This is getting spicy. So we've got confusion, nausea, headache, and now isolated hyperreflexia on the right leg. This all doesn't quite add up to be a brain problem. You see the reflex arc actually doesn't need the brain to function. And there's a very good reason for that. Reflexes need to be as fast as possible to protect your tissue. Reflexes to tendon stretching and heat are similar and controlled by a sensory arc into neuron and motor arc. The sensory arc sends the signal that something hot is there through the dorsal root ganglion or the back of the spinal cord where sensation is mainly processed. Then an interneuron or relay neuron moves the signal from the back of the spinal cord to the front where the motor neurons that can do something about it are located. Then sends the signals back to the muscle to flex and withdraw the area from the painful stimulus. As you can see, none of this directly involves the brain, but there is an added layer of complexity called upper motor neurons, which regulate this whole pathway. So if you have a problem with these regulatory neurons higher up, that can lead to an increased exaggeration of reflexes or hyperreflexia, as you can see here. So it's more likely that he could have a spinal cord lesion associated with a systemic condition that is also causing his other symptoms like sarcoidosis or lupus. I would definitely want an autoimmune screen, a chest x-ray, and to take a family history at this point. But question for you smart people, how long does a tendon reflex take in milliseconds? Answers down below. Well, there is something in Broca's area, but it's small, low intensity want to cut into his brain. Dangerous, I know, especially since he's a politician and his brain's all twisted. Twisted is exactly how we like it. Have you seen how quickly Fusili sells? Okay, that was such a dad joke. Broca's area is a very interesting spot in the brain as it controls the motor production of language. With a lesion there, then our politician who clearly had the gift of the gab may have that taken away very soon if the lesion progresses. The most common cause would be a stroke, but it sounds like it's a small dot, which means stroke is unlikely unless it's a very small blood vessel. Other spicier house-esque causes include brain infection, lymphoma, autoimmune conditions like vasculitis, sarcoidosis, or our favorite diagnosis, lupus are still on the cards. Would definitely want to see all the blood tests before wanting to pick his brain. Literally, let's get more clues. You're not pregnant. Well, I told you that. The reason I'm still spotting. Well, so you've had a miscarriage. I haven't even been on a date. I haven't had sex. The only thing better than houses clinic scenes are houses clinic scenes that are absolutely bonkers and still true. Believe it or not, you don't have to denounce science and move into a monastery to believe in immaculate conception, which is what this lady is claiming to have. That's because of a case report from the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology written by an obstetrician called Vercule. A 15 year old girl was admitted to the hospital after a knife fight involving her, an ex and a new partner. The girl had a stab wound to the upper abdomen, causing a stomach and a hand wound. She needed to be rushed to surgery to have these repaired. And in the operation, the stomach was empty at the time and the abdomen was washed with normal saline and then the wound was closed. Exactly 278 days later, she came back to hospital with abdominal pain and she was pregnant. She also said she had never had sex, just like our lady in the clinic. There was one Critical difference though, she had no vagina. That was due to a rare condition called malarian agenesis, which in her form allowed the vagina to be just a dimple in the skin. So how did she get pregnant? Moments before she was stabbed as she had practiced fellatio on her new boyfriend, it's thought that the high pH of the saliva protected the sperm from the stomach acid and the gap between the fellatio and the stabbing was small enough to allow the sperm to survive in her stomach and gain access to the reproductive tract in quite a backdoor way through the abdomen. It's also thought that she became pregnant with her first or near first cycle. Otherwise, all the blood that would build up within the wound would have made fertilization impossible. I wonder how the ex felt after he realized that he helped the new pregnancy happen. Karmic justice in action. You're not doing a brain biopsy based on a spot on an MRI. 
Not on a United States senator. Or well, what happened to the ethical principle of justice? All patients should be treated fairly. Exactly how Boris Johnson was when he was prime minister and got a bed in the intensive care unit in St. Thomas's Hospital with two nurses supervising his care 24-7 while he had mild COVID. Mild COVID. Just routine practice? Yeah, for prime ministers. Not for Joe Bloggs and definitely not for doctors. They've got a separate room to treat us in the cellar next to the Legionella cultures. It's not a brain tumor. It's toxoplasmosis. Which means the great black hope has full-blown AIDS. Oh, House has more twists and turns than a punctured unicycle ride. So the patient has toxoplasmosis, HIV and AIDS all in one. Not the best package deal I've seen, but we can work with it. So what is toxoplasmosis? It's an infection of a parasitic species known as Toxoplasma gondii. It's present all over the world, but cats, mice, and livestock can host the organism. You can become infected through exposure to cat feces, undercooked meat, or there have been cases of contraction through organ transplant as well. It's important to say that one thing that isn't quite accurate here from House is that you don't need to have HIV to get an acute toxoplasmosis infection, but it tends to be self-limiting as your system clears that infection and it lasts a few weeks to months. Let's go with it though, as it does make for some good television. The signs of toxoplasmosis would usually be present as bilateral, non-tender swelling of the neck nodes within a few weeks of infection. That can be accompanied by fever, sweats, and chills, which can sometimes confuse doctors into thinking the patient has lymphoma or tuberculosis. So to diagnose it, you check for antibodies to the parasite, or you can check the cerebrospinal fluid for DNA through amplification techniques like PCR. It would be very unusual to diagnose it through a brain biopsy as the spinal fluid would give you the answer. In HIV patients, pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine will clear up the infection. Let's see what happens here. Maybe there's a spicy story for how he got his HIV diagnosis. Toxoplasmosis is a fairly common fungus you can get. Toxoplasmosis? A fungus? That isn't quite right, Foreman, but don't worry, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. At the writers, not you, of course. You're epic, Foreman. Toxoplasmosis is a protozoa. And to understand why it isn't a fungus, then we need to know how microorganisms are classified. You have prokaryotes, which have no nucleus, and eukaryotes that have one. Both fungi and protozoa are eukaryotes. Now, fungi are always multicellular organisms, whereas protozoa is single-celled, as is Toxoplasmosis gondii. Where the writers may have got mixed up is that histoplasmosis is a parasitic fungus also found in HIV patients. Easy mistake to make and definitely still enjoying the episode. Now treat the man! I do not have AIDS. You haven't even tested me for HIV. You are going to test me for HIV under a false name. You are going to test me for cancer. House has done some rogue stuff in the past and most of the time you can kind of understand, but this time he's gone full ape shit. Never go full ape shit. Why would he try and treat a patient for AIDS without testing first? A HIV test literally takes 30 minutes to process in the lab. Nowadays, we even have point of care HIV tests that can detect the virus in a patient's saliva or a drop of blood that take just a few minutes to run. How's it just doing it for the drama? What a diva. Eastbrook Pharmaceuticals are pleased to announce that Dr. Gregory House will present their latest research on their exciting new ACE inhibitor. You made a deal with Vogler? Nobody is immune to Vogler's pressures, not even House. But if we take a second to think about it, House is exactly like the slow Loris. It appears cute and cuddly on the outside with eyes that put you at ease, but threaten their territory and you soon discover that they are the only venomous primate in existence with such a potency that even when mixed with their saliva, the venom can kill you through anaphylactic shock. Vogler better not count the slow Larisse out as when he lets his guard down, he'll be in for a shock. Patients lie, politicians lie more, and black politicians. <laughs> I just can't get away with it. 
And when it happens, it's a bad role model. It's, it's obvious that racial disparities still exist. And as a Middle Eastern origin person, I've experienced that firsthand, particularly after Brexit in the UK. Ethnic minorities have poorer health outcomes, education levels, and socioeconomic status. On an individual level, it's very unlikely we can change any of that. And focusing on it can actually heighten any real disadvantages that we may have. In some cases, being part of certain communities can be turned into an unfair advantage, just like Tristan Walker, who created an over $100 million company, Walker & Company, in 2013, when he realized that mainstream beauty companies didn't cater to black men's hair. Another strong reason why adopting the victim mentality is dangerous is the 1991 Dartmouth scar experiment. 27 males and 21 females were told they were joining an experiment to observe the differences in behavior toward people with scars. A makeup artist fashioned a scar on their face, allowed the person to look at it in a pocket mirror, and invited participants to leave the room and interact with other people in the building. Just before leaving the room, the makeup artist told the participants that the scar needed adjustment and wiped it off. After they came back, they were asked how their interactions went and overwhelmingly, participants said that they were treated worse, people were cruel, and that they were staring at their scar. Some even mentioned the fact that they didn't mention the scar as a reason for others judging them. From that, we can see how beneficial it can be, even for ourselves, to give others the benefit of the doubt and not to try to search for hidden clues of discrimination on an individual level. Patechial bruising? I don't know if I pronounced that right. More likely diagnosis is hickey. I'm not having sex. You're lying or I'm wrong. There's some middle ground. You mean like oral? Like oral! Like oral! Why do they always have to make the blondes one fry shot of a happy meal? You see, the middle ground the house is talking about is that she is having sex but doesn't know about it. It would be pretty tough to get a hickey and pregnant from oral, although not impossible. House wants to test her for alcohol, drugs, especially GHB, which is a date rape drug. It comes as a liquid which people put in pipettes or even the little sushi wasabi bottles. It acts on the inhibitory GABAergic receptors in the brain to reduce neuronal activity. Kind of like spending the day watching TikTok. One of the worst things about it is that when mixed with alcohol, it can actually be lethal. And so that's why if you're in a club, keep your drinks with you at all times. Don't even ask a friend to look after it as they can get distracted. So the only person you can trust to make sure it's safe is yourself. We see the after effects of this time and time again in hospital. And trust me, prevention is definitely easier than the cure. In this case, stay safe. It's positive. T cell count is eight. You need to stop lying to me. Nurse! Oh, he does have HIV. And House thinks he's hiding his sexual orientation. And that's how he got it. Now, just last year in the UK, the number of new HIV diagnoses was actually higher in the heterosexual population than amongst gay men. That's likely because even though gay men are more at risk, efforts to try and educate and test them are much greater. When I was on my sexual health rotation, I actually saw a 33-year-old female who was feeling unwell for about eight months and was then diagnosed with HIV by us and she was shocked. Even her doctor didn't suspect it as a cause and she never realized women could be affected. Now this patient has a T cell count, which more specifically is the CD4 count of eight. To give you perspective on how insanely low that is, a normal CD4 count is between 500 and 1500. We call it AIDS when it's less than 200 and his was eight. That puts him at risk for all kinds of opportunistic infections like toxoplasmosis, certain types of pneumonia like pneumocystis or legionella, and atypical meningitis caused by things like cryptococcus. Now he's lost power and sensation in his leg, which in advanced HIV can be called vacuolar myelopathy. So House says this patient is likely going to die, and that's true if he goes without treatment, 
he will be dead from two years after symptom onset. With treatment, however, he will likely live a normal life expectancy so pump that senator full of drugs. Now, if you're interested in some exclusive channel perks, then check out the channel membership. Members can recommend a series and episode for me to react to, get priority replies in comments, early access to new videos, and a spot in all giveaways. Right now, the first 30 members will win a chance to get a one hour, one-on-one -on -one summer mind bender medical tutor session on a topic of your choice with me. We have 11 members as you can see here right now, so there are only 19 spots left. Click join down below to secure your place while they're still available as this offer will never be available again. What's going on? The antiretrovirals aren't working. Because you don't have AIDS. First test was a false positive. Happens one time in every 5,000. Oh, we are back in business and we have no idea what the diagnosis is. This whole false positive thing as well is not a thing. Yeah, the HIV test could be a false positive for sure, but the fact that the CD4 count backed up the AIDS diagnosis means the odds of both of them being wrong are like one in 10 million. Although that's pretty common for House to be fair, considering we've seen a diagnosis of rabies, which is more like one in 100 million. Now, we don't know what has caused this patient's symptoms. So what do we know so far? He had speech disturbance, a speck on his brain, which we think is toxoplasmosis, but could be something else, paralysis of the right leg, but not of the left or the arms. We know he broke up with his wife and has had two girlfriends since then, which he used protection with. Now this guy seems as clean as a whistle, a role model, just like the title, but maybe it's his healthy lifestyle that's made him sick. Here's my theory. He was going to a school in the Midwest to give a talk to underprivileged children. On the way, he stopped off and needed to use the toilet, but the one in the gas station was broken. So he went and peed in the back of the gas station out in the middle of nowhere. And he didn't realize at the time that he was peeing next to a nuclear dump site. So that radiation could have caused immunosuppression or CNS lymphoma, which we might see on the bone marrow. Could also give him a quick Geiger counter check just to make sure of the diagnosis. Pretty wild theory. Let's find out more. Give him a whole body scan. You're lying. No. And I have a new symptom. I have a rash on my butt. I just wake up really exhausted. You may think this is unrealistic that a patient would just come in and drop her pants like this, but you'd be mistaken. A few weeks ago in my doctor's surgery, there was a 28 year old female patient who went to reception asking to book her an appointment and they asked her what the problem was. She turned around and dropped her trousers in the reception area, in the reception area with three or four other patients around. So much for confidentiality. Now this patient is talking about being tired when waking up and hasn't been spiked, has a carpet burn on her bum, hickey on the neck, and has been pregnant. Reminds me of a case of a middle-aged Australian woman who was leaving the bedroom in the middle of the night while sleepwalking. Her husband woke up one night and went looking for her and found her in the act with a stranger. She was assessed by psychiatrists and scanned for physical problems like brain tumors and none could explain the situation. Maybe that's what happened here. Maybe she's sleepwalking and having sex with someone. Also, our politician is getting a full body scan. On average, if we did one of those on a healthy person, we would find three incidental findings called incidental omas that would look concerning, but actually be of no clinical consequence. That's part of the reason why we don't like doing unnecessary tests. My ex lives in the apartment downstairs. He's always calling me. They're complaining about mixed signals. We have a sleep lab in the basement. Slightly enlarged lymph node in his left armpit. Ex lives downstairs. No wonder he's complaining about mixed signals. He keep wandering into his bedroom every night. <laughs> At least she doesn't have a husband like our Australian lady did when she was sneaking out and sleeping with strangers. Now to test for sleepwalking with the sleep study, sensors are placed to record brain waves, oxygen levels, heart rate, breathing, eye movements, and leg movement while sleeping. Camera footage can be collected as well to show you once you wake up 
or sell on OnlyFans. Now it sounds like we've found an enlarged lymph node for our patient, so it would be good to know, is it isolated or are there multiple groups? If it's isolated, then lymphadenitis or even a breast cancer could be possible. It happens in men as well. One in 140 cases of breast cancer are in males. Or if there are multiple nodes, then it could be a lymphoma, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, or Castleman's disease, which causes non-cancerous growths of lymph tissue. Let's get more clues. Two more in his neck and one in his groin. And there's a cyst in his liver. The lymph nodes all came back clean. His left arm did not have has antibodies for CD11. They were tested for hairy cell leukemia. Hairy cell leukemia? Now that's a diagnosis made for me. They call that because they actually look hairy on a peripheral blood smear. It is an interesting disease because even though it's called a leukemia, many sources categorize it as a subtype of a special kind of lymphoma called chronic lymphocytic lymphoma. Another classification is as a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which means it doesn't have reed Sternberg cells, which are lymph cells with two nuclei, which kind of look like owl eyes. Now House mentioned here the CD11 receptor being present on the armpit node and on the birth theme I may be being hawkish but it's CD11C specifically that would cause a hairy cell and CLL association. That may seem a little harsh but CD11A is just a normal peripheral immune marker and CD11B in cancers represents a totally different condition called acute myeloid leukemia which looks like this i'm sure you can appreciate that unless those hairy cells have taken a trip to the beauty salon this is a different condition it's looking like hematological malignancy is most likely right now but a viral infection like epstein-barr virus or mono or kissing disease would work pretty well here too other viral infections could be cmv roseola herpes simplex or adenovirus Secondary syphilis could also present like this. I definitely want to check all his skin and groin area for rashes and do a viral and repeat syphilis screen. I can't get air. The senator's breathing is severely impaired. His silver stain indicates pneumocystis carnea pneumonia. Okay, there is no mistaking it now. This man has AIDS without HIV and his CD4 cell count is still Eight. I know that because Pneumocystis carinae, now renamed Pneumocystis gerovecchiae, is another AIDS-defining illness along with toxoplasmosis. So we would call this patient's condition idiopathic CD4 lymphopenia. This is an incredibly rare condition which would affect less than one in a hundred thousand AIDS patients but it isn't a diagnosis and more of a sign in itself. So what could it represent? What if there is a viral infection of another retrovirus related to HIV, which is mimicking AIDS like HTLV1 or human T lymphotropic virus 1? It causes recruitment and reductions in immune cells, can cause leukemia or lymphoma, highly endemic in sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean, and it has an extremely long latency period of 30 years. It would fit the story here perfectly. You could test using a screening assay and there is no specific treatment, but there are experimental therapies like cabotegravir or bictegravir. It would be insane if I got that right, but it just fits so well. Can I also say Joe Morton, who plays the senator here, has had a brilliant performance in this episode so far. You know, when the Inuit go fishing, they don't look for fish. Why, Dr. House? They look for the blue heron. But if there's fish, there's gonna be birds fishing. HTLV and ATLV. Oh, I just beat them to it. Come on, tell me that is the diagnosis now. That would be clutch. I may get the diagnosis though, but I need to work on my delivery metaphors. Did you see that blue heron metaphor? <laughs> Incredible. Although I did use the slow Loris metaphor earlier, so maybe we're yet to see House's venomous bite before that conference speech. It's an abrupt jump from slow wave sleeping. Sleepwalking. That would explain why I'm so tired when I wake up. And also why you were pregnant. I had sex in my sleep. Sexomnia! What 
a diagnosis. It actually happens during the non-rapid eye movement phase of sleep, which is the deepest stage and is dreamless. This is very different to wet dreams, the medical word of which is nocturnal emission that happens during the REM stage of sleep while dreaming. Things that can make it more likely are obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux disease, childhood trauma, or alcohol and drug use. Treatment can be with antidepressant medications or sedatives and treating the underlying cause. Psychological interventions are also very important to help reduce embarrassment of the event and help if a partner is affected by the symptoms as well. Negative for HTLV1 and 2 and negative for ATLV and everything else. It's not hairy cell. It's positive for Epstein-Barr. You didn't fall off the swings when you were eight. All right, so it isn't HGLV1, but Epstein-Barr virus is positive, which is a virus that causes mono that I mentioned earlier. It still doesn't quite explain why House is trying to asphyxiate the patient by taking away his non-invasive ventilation mask, but it sure is interesting to watch. There are definitely still some gaps here which aren't telling the whole story. He's been positive for toxoplasmosis, EBV, PCP, AIDS. If he collects any more acronyms, then he'll need to start selling conference tickets. Definitely one way to fund a campaign. Also, if you're wondering what House is talking about, read the swing. Then earlier in the episode, the senator said he bit his lip when he was younger because he fell off the swing. That is quite an unlikely situation, so it seems House now knows he's hiding something. Tongue biting can be a sign of seizure or loss of consciousness that the patient is trying to hide for his political campaign. How that relates to the Eureka Epstein-Barr virus moment is about as clear to me as the English sky. Let's find out more. Take that back. You had an epileptic seizure. That's how you bit your tongue. Uh, what medication did you take? Phenytoin? Yeah. Where did House get his medical education from? Guantanamo Bay. In today's lesson, we're going to be learning about the lungs, the importance of oxygenation, and asphyxia as a tool. Any questions? To be fair, he did get some spicy information there, as now we know he took phenytoin. How is that related to EBV? Phenytoin induces liver enzymes, so maybe that could lead to a faster clearance of antivirals, causing the Epstein-Barr virus to stick around, but it sounds like they haven't treated for that. Another possibility is that EBV could sensitize the immune system and lead to reactions to phenytoin becoming more common. Some theories, but nothing convincing really. Now, a question for you smart people. How long does the brain last in normal body temperatures without oxygen before getting damaged? Answers down below. Everybody lies. Oh, that was cold, even for House. I can see why the episode is called Role Model now. Sometimes we have fed stories of ideal situations and people to look up to, yet as soon as you scratch the surface just a little bit, you realize that the public image is just a mask created by a whole team of people whose primary goal is to try and give a person the characteristics that would be most popular. I think that's part of the reason why many young people gravitate toward YouTube over conventional TV nowadays. It's much more authentic. And this senator, we have now confirmed that he was lying about that story when he fell as a kid to hide his epilepsy diagnosis. Just own it. He took phenytoin. That drug with the Epstein-Barr virus is associated with common variable immunodeficiency disease. Start the senator on IV immunoglobulin stat. Antibody deficiencies are the most common primary immunodeficiency disease. Now, they usually present in children with multiple opportunistic infections. That's because antibodies serve many essential functions in the body, like binding to invading pathogens to allow them to be engulfed, they allow complement to be activated, which are proteins in the blood that help to activate other immune cells. They can eat or phagocytose the invading pathogens. Now you can test for this antibody deficiency by doing the pre and post vaccination tests. You give the patient the vaccine and then test for an antibody response 
And if it isn't there, that means that there is a deficiency of antibody production. The treatment House is giving is basically replacing the lost antibodies and vaccinating with inactive vaccines. You have to be very careful not to give active vaccines like nasal influenza, BCG or MMR to patients with this common variable immunodeficiency disorder as they will develop the condition due to poor immune responses to the vaccines that are live. Let's find out how he reacts and I definitely want to know if House gives this talk or not. Say antiretroviral. Antiretroviral. Am I well enough to run for president? I, I won't win. Then why run? The only way to make a difference is to win every fight. Oh, the senator is saying that you don't need to win every fight to make a difference and House felt that one, relating it to his power struggle with Vogler and being forced to give the talk at Eastbrook. You see, even though the data he's been given looks promising, House doesn't believe that it is actually more beneficial to the patients than the current alternative. I've said it before and I'll say it again, studies sponsored by pharmaceutical companies are four times more likely to show a favorable outcome compared to other sponsors. There are other possibilities that could account for this, like possible differences in background work completed, but the proposed explanation in 2003 was that there is publication bias, negative publications won't get published. Also, inappropriate comparators being selected as a baseline for a new drug to battle against could be another reason. So you have to always be careful when interpreting research as the devils are in the detail. Nuance is very important in medicine. Now, I can't wait any longer. Show me the speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Greg House. Ed Vogler is a brilliant businessman. Whenever one of his drugs is about to lose its patent, he has his boys and girls alter it just a tiny bit. And finally, the slow Loris prepares to make its venomous bite. You see, at the beginning of the speech, House tried to keep it short and sweet, just reading the first sentence on the report when Vogler threatened him to go back on stage and this is what he did. This is about to get very spicy. Making not just a pointless new pill, but millions and millions of dollars. Which is good for everybody, right? It's patience, but let's have a big round of applause for Ed Vogler. I threw in a joke. I threw in a joke. I threw in a joke. Talk about adding insult to injury. There's gonna be more backlash from this than an MP cheating scandal. What a role model. I've seen better examples of social distancing from a herd of seals. Well done, health secretary. I wanna see what Vogler does to the team now because he doesn't seem like the type of guy that will just let this slide. Really liking this episode. So many unique themes for me to talk about. A out of 10 for entertainment, six out of 10 for accuracy, and eight out of 10 for diagnosis. You don't need to worry about firing anyone. I'm leaving. Why? You ask me why I like you. Everything you do, you do it to help people. Cameron is leaving? What? Maybe that will force House's hand now to admit that he actually likes her since she said that she was doing this to take control. Either she stays and they get together or she leaves and takes the ball of her own destiny by the horns since House seems to be lacking them. This episode is good, but it only really starts to make sense when you watch the previous one where we find out who in the team is helping Vogler. So check that out here. I'm Saramed, stay curious.